We're on the edge of the street in front of the buildings of Sandberg and Riedfeld. I'm next to you. The sun is behind me and I am backlit, looking your way. Casting a bit of a shadow on you, I move to the side to watch the light appear on your face and say, Lecker wer, toch? I'm wearing light blue pants and a brown puffy jacket. My white skin is extra pale these winter days. Even my freckles have faded. For some reason, I thought about a time when someone told me that when my eyes are closed, my eyelids look iridescent like pearls. I told you only because I hoped you would see that too. We're waiting for a moment to gather ourselves before we enter the building. I look up at the height of these two towering structures and feel dizzy. Students, staff, and teachers are walking around outside, and it's hard to tell what the COVID situation is, just like being in the rest of this country. You know how rough and confusing it has been in this post-pandemic state. My partner has long COVID, and I go to a hospice each week. In the economics of my life, it would cost a lot to get the virus, and I simply can't afford it. So I pull my face mask out of my pocket to get ready, fingering the straps as if I'm a cowboy in a showdown. I thought our presentation would take place in the Rietveld building, but instead it's in the auditorium room of FedLev. This room must be wheelchair accessible. I take a deep breath and let out an exhale. Welp, we're here, darling. Is this your first time? Exploring my surroundings, many memories come back to me. My high school days, which were during the early 2010s, were spent very close to this building. Rietveld's canteen was considered superior to ours, and me and my friends would sometimes look at each other with a spark in our eyes, a secret agreement, a wordless sign to spend our pocket money well. Rietveld's canteen sandwiches which were tightly wrapped in plastic foil, were filled with avocado, lettuce, tomato, a colorful view compared to the full-grain cheese bread rolls our school canteen had to offer. Rietveld's canteen, in other words, was an entrance into a world of abundance, or so I thought then. You could choose what kind of bread toppings you wanted, which for me radiated endless possibilities. I decided I wanted to study there. I look at you and wonder where to begin. Yes, I have, is how far my courage reaches. This is not the time to embellish on life's disappointments. I'm sure we'll have this conversation later. In silence, I grab my mask out the pocket of my wool winter coat. I look down at my shoes and notice stains on them a reminiscent of the cold Dutch winter that hasn't seemed to end. Without saying anything, I hand my mask to you to help me put it on. How do you feel? I ask. I'd let you know that I'm doing okay, but I have a little bit of residual pain. Today marks three months since my surgery, three long, humbling months of healing and awe. I tried to nestle this sense of time visually. Compared to my three years of painful thoracic outlet syndrome from an accident, it's like the seed of yin within yang. I have been involved in disability activism and accessibility organizing for much longer but this was my lived, embodied experience of chronic pain. For the surgery, and all through my armpit, they removed my left first rib from sternum to spine, underneath my collarbone, along with the muscles connected to it. The calloused rib was no longer compressing a bundle of nerves, vessels, and arteries. The numbness in my armpit around the drain holes is still there, but I told you about that. You know all about my experiences with the hospital. 
Each day during my recovery, you sent me an audio message of you reading me a poem. It was a favorite ritual of my healing. And you would often ask how, how I was doing if I became a little too quiet about expressing my experience. Part of access intimacy, as I've come to understand it, is investing in another's care through curiosity and openness. Part of the choreography of access is to anticipate, imagine, a few moves in advance. The more information, the greater the possibility for our care. Before the event starts, I could help you with the vase. It won't be like last time where you had to be extra careful with my arm, okay? I smiled at you clumsily. The last time was our first time, and I thought if I mention it again, it could potentially soften any tension you might feel. We're standing in front of the automatic sliding glass doors, which are more seamless to move through. The wood shop looks like a labyrinth, though. Did they know we would show up to the program like this? I look at you again and realize I too am fooled. Even though I've virtually been a part of your recovery, receiving updates almost daily at the beginning, I'm sitting in front of you and I'm visually faced with the same body as before the surgery. I too, like most people, could think I am faced with a so-called healthy body, a body without physical limitations, pain or discomfort. I remember a conversation I had with you, the same conversation I tried to open with other disabled friends about the many complexities and differences in experience when having a body that looks different, a body that feels different, a body that can't keep up, a body that's tired, a body that, in the words of the boringly often quoted psychologist Bessel van der Kolk, keeps the score versus a visually disabled looking body, whatever that means. I am hesitantly and almost ironically quoting von der Kolk, since his questioning of the body-mind dichotomy is so outdated, I find it almost laughable. The door opens automatically, and you put your hand on my shoulder, sweetly boosting my confidence with touch. My wheels, in combination with the smooth floor, makes squeaky sounds when I turn. Then I see the elevator. Knowing your sensitive character, I realize that you must be fully aware of my sudden emotion without even looking at me. My teenage self was highly disappointed when confronted with the narrow elevator in the Hutzfeld building. My dreams of becoming a photographer quickly but painfully faded away when the door of the elevator kept reopening, a sign of my chair being too big. This Sandberg elevator seems wider, and even though I have anticipated this moment, by asking Simon for the measurements, I am still nervous about the sound of the door possibly reopening like it did before. It's funny how the discomfort of my own presence is expressed by sound, as if the world needs to scream that I am, indeed, not very comfortable with existing within inaccessible architectural spaces. After telling me about your initial experience with Riedfeld's elevator, time seemed to accumulate around us. I was nervous about getting into the elevator now too, and also indignant. Fuck that elevator, I say and then add. If this one is also too small, well, to hell with this elevator too. I imagine a fiery hell filled with assemblages of elevators too small for manual and power wheelchairs. And then I thought, at least we're here together. It's going to be fine since we're together. I motioned with a nod for you to go first so I could follow you. 
as you smoothly slide through the door. We're checking the sides in front of your chair, making sure you have enough room. We trade observational O's and gratifying yas as we fit right into place. I press the button for the level below. We let out a sigh. As we descend, I remember from the verbal description tour that we received in anticipation of this event that the bathroom is on the left and the space where we present in is on the right. From behind you, I reach my hand to your shoulder again to check in. I grin internally when thinking of the many moments we've discussed COVID safety before coming, but not mentioning the elevator once. Your hand on my shoulder, the fuck that elevator, our witty interaction when faced with inaccessibility, it all transforms moments like these into something intimate and even precious. It almost feels like a loss that most people will never experience intimacy like this. When confronted with this type of closeness, I can't help but think about American Korean educator and thinker Mia Mingus and her text called Access Intimacy, a term that she coined, which continues to be an essential piece for many activists and academics. Mingus describes it as follows. Access intimacy is that elusive, hard to describe feeling when someone else gets your access needs. The kind of eerie comfort that your disabled self feels with someone on a purely access level. Sometimes it can happen with complete strangers, disabled or not, or sometimes it can be built over years. You know, Mingus emphasizes that access intimacy needs to be cultivated because interdependence is often romanticized. We all need each other, or we're all connected. It's incredibly difficult and challenging when the necessity of care is one-sided, or when the body is in pain and vulnerable in a way the other isn't. How to cultivate an understanding without mutuality, sameness. Maybe that is something we should talk about with this group. But how do we do so in such a way that is not divisive or essentializing? I become a little embarrassed. I'm aware of my abilities and all the privileges that come with them. I wonder to myself if you and I have felt that tension before. And not if, but when we do. How we will acknowledge and discuss it with grace and tenderness. I look down at the gray concrete floor while we wait there, squeezed in this hallway before a manual door and then a sliding glass one leading to the auditorium. I hold open the door for you as we both enter this small, liminal space. We can see everyone gathered on the stairs. They can see us. We're both gazing through the glass at the steep temple of stairs in the space from our little fishbowl. Noticing the only on-grade area in the front of this room, you tell me that wheelchair users and people that use any kind of mobility aid can't comfortably sit without being aware of how much space they take up. Do you think the designers and architects could have added any more stairs to this building? I let out a nervous laugh before collecting myself to continue. How different do you think this building would look if it were designed by someone who uses or loves someone who uses a wheelchair. Not from the perspective of universal design, which still centers a body without a mobility aid, but actually inclusive design. You sing back, the outcome would be something of disability aesthetics.
We are still in this awkward space that fits only us between two glass doors. We are at the threshold. We are here in this way because it happens to be the only way we could be here. We've made an effort. Effort and intention might not be everything, but it's something. You look at me and say, how can we possibly describe the access intimacy that we have with each other?